if there's something you really want to do, you are going to face challenges and that you're going to have to put the phone away to study for that test, to write that thesis, to apply for those jobs. So you can have that whole conversation, which is a really interesting conversation to have with these kids because they're very tuned in. They have access to all this information. So they've seen things online that they want to do so that you can gain that information. Welcome to episode five of Mental Health in the Age of the Metaverse. I'm your host, Christian Alstrup, and every episode I sit down with a mental health professional to talk about tech, including virtual reality, cryptocurrency, social media, and the rapidly evolving internet landscape and how technology impacts our mental health. My guest today is Jamie Ziegler. Jamie is training to be a licensed professional counselor in New Jersey. He works with adolescents and families in a private group practice where he also uses technology like virtual reality to connect with clients. Before becoming a therapist, Jamie was a sales professional in the education space. Jamie, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Very excited to be here. Now, you are a rare example of someone who has traversed the sales professional to mental health professional pipeline. Uh, how did you decide to become a counselor? Sure. Yeah. I don't know that it was uh, so much a decision as it kind of just happened. And I think there's a lot of answers to that question, but it really boils down to kind of a professional and then a personal um, element. So the, the shorter, the prof professional element is basically, I spent my 20s in sales, like you mentioned. I loved my job. I loved my employer, my colleagues, my clients, loved what I was doing. Um, in terms of the connection with people. It was more the content of kind of what I was selling. The day-to-day -day grind of sales, it sort of never stops. And I just, in, in my head, I kind of knew that there was something else that I wanted to do. I wasn't quite sure what that was. I'm surrounded by educators in my life uh, on a personal level. And professionally, I was working alongside educators and just kind of saw them serving other people felt like I had something to offer. So kind of bleeds into the personal side of it. It was probably about four years ago. I had a, I go back and forth between nervous breakdown and epiphany, and it was probably both of those things. Uh, and I sort of had just a moment of clarity where I was like, okay, I got to change some things in my life. This just doesn't quite feel aligned. It doesn't feel right. Um, sort of holding up like a house of cards. So I took about a year to just explore. I had a lot of conversations with mental health professionals. Specifically, uh, mental health is something for me that's been pretty, it, it's had an impact on me in my life. You know, I've had my own struggles with anxiety, depression growing up. And, you know, it's touched, I think everyone's at this point is sort of touched by things like mental health and uh, addiction and and things like that. So that's sort of what I turned to. I read a ton of books, talked to a lot of people, had some really amazing conversations. And about a year later, I enrolled in um, a master's program for clinical mental health counseling, spent the past three years studying, learning, uh, was working full time in my sales role for two of those years. And then for this academic year, so since like September or October of 2021, have been working, interning at a private practice here in uh, in New Jersey, kind of right in the shadow of Rutgers University. And it's been quite a ride. It's been a great experience. And yeah, it sort of just happened and it's taken a lot of work, but that initial kind of switch was very sudden. And I had some pieces to pick up, but it was pretty clear from that moment on that I was going to do something else. Excellent. And it sounds like this is, this is quite personal. Um, I, f I feel like for a lot of folks who are, are good and passionate about what they're doing, that's, that's usually the case. And you and I, I believe, are about the same age. Uh, we're kind of late millennials, uh, not quite Gen Z, so not, not mm -hmm. fully plugged in, but we certainly grew up with technology, and this is something I talk to my co-founders a lot about, is what it was like in those early days of the internet really taking off when it started becoming more mainstream and 
whether it was, you know, it's like after school, you're pulling around on new grounds or sending each other videos on, AI, you know, what was it? AIM uh, to like E-bombs world or, or something terrible like that when you're 11 <laughs> or 12. Um, it certainly was something that we grew up with. And, uh, you know, I, I do think there's a lot of interplay between mental health, um, especially for adolescents uh, and, and technology. And although it's getting attention now, I do think this has kind of always been the case, at, at least for the last 20 years. So I, I'd love to hear uh, for you, both personally and professionally, um, what has been the role of technology in, in your own life? Sure. Yeah, thank you for that question. I would say that my relationship with technology, uh, when I was younger, as a child, as an adolescent, it's something that was very simple. And I would say overall positive that has gotten infinitely more complicated. And I don't want to say more negative, but it's been a lot more work to try to manage, you know, this whole landscape. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess what I mean by that is growing up, like, like you said, I grew up in the nineties. I, for me, technology was basically cartoons and video games, Nintendo, super Nintendo, you know, playing super Mario with my brother and, uh, and my dad. And, um, it was great because it was so, I could only do it when I was kind of in that space there. We had a little corner of our house that had a TV and it had a, the setup there. And, um, you know, in the morning I might turn on Nickelodeon or Cartoon Network and I would have that, but then I would go to school and I would have, you know, eight hours and maybe sports afterwards of no screens. The only screen I saw was maybe like that projector thing that the Elmo or whatever it was where the teacher was like taking notes and that's not even really a screen. So there was this huge gap during the day. I would come back home and I would have access to technology again. And I would, you know, turn on the television or we would get homework done and play some video games, but we would do it also. We would do it together. At that point, I couldn't play with my friend across town or someone across the world. It was my buddy had to come over or, you know, my brother and I had to go down there together and play together. So even though it was a screen, there was still someone with you. It was still kind of like a it was a bonding, not that it's not a bonding experience now, but it was very personal. As I got older, obviously things just sped up, you know, flip phones became, you know, then it was texting and it was, I could communicate with friends that way, which was great. Still wasn't easy. I was like using T9 or whatever. And then that became a Blackberry, which became an iPhone, which is now I have a supercomputer in my pocket at all times and sometimes on my wrist as well. And it's, um, so personally it's, it's become difficult. I mean, I even struggle with my own tech usage. It, sometimes I feel, I do feel I've gotten much more sensitive to it. So I feel burnt out pretty quickly and I notice when I'm overusing it, but, um, it's, it's, it's complicated at this point. It's, um, I think it's an amazing tool. Professionally, I used it in my sales role to be more efficient. Uh, which was a great tool. And then I think as that applies to mental health, it's, we see our system. I've, so, we have so many people come into our private practice and they're like, it's so hard to find therapists. There's a bottleneck and people want to process what's going on. They want mental health care. They want to talk to somebody. They want to work on themselves, but there's just not, the system is not that efficient. And so I think that things like tech, the things that technology offers are you know, ways for us to kind of streamline certain processes so that the people who work in the industry can actually connect and work with people as opposed to be kind of managing paperwork and all of that other mess. So I, I, um, I think it has tremendous implications for, for mental health care, for sure. So at, a, at its best, it helps you do away with those processes that are not the best use of your your talent, right? So you can you can really focus on working with clients um, and make sure the right people get connected with you. I think that makes a ton of sense. I do want to pull on one thread you brought up that back in the 90s, 2000s, there was much more of a clean separation. And when it comes to technology, obviously that's there's like a 
million different ways that you could you could kind of um, bucket different types of technology, but entertainment, digital media, you have work tools, enterprise tools that make you more efficient. Mm -hmm. But there's there's also this stuff that that hooks you in that's that's fun. It can be a medium for social connection. You mentioned playing games with with your family. Um, what what have you done sort of personally to to figure out how to have a healthy relationship with technology um, in a world where all of that now is just there's no separation unless you're intentional about it? Sure. Yeah, I think you touch on it. the The environment used to do that work for us, right? We just it wasn't available now it's it's everywhere so we have to kind of take on the responsibility of setting those boundaries for ourselves you know working with our family members to do the same and our as a mental health professional with our clients for me like i said i i think just um throughout the pandemic i, I worked virtually and i think just started to notice that like zoom fatigue so I think everyone maybe has a different level of sensitivity to it. So for me, it would just kind of burn me out. I wouldn't feel good afterwards. I would feel exhausted at the end of a day, even though I was kind of just sitting in, in the office talking to people on the computer. But it's like the eye strain, the, you know, the focus that it requires. For me, what has actually worked is I have, I have um, the Apple products. So I have an iPhone and they have an app limit. Uh, I recently just, even just probably two weeks ago, I found myself sort of falling down that like Instagram rabbit hole uh, for longer than I would like. And I guess I've sort of trained that muscle just to, I set the limit for myself at a half an hour a day. I was like, I'm really not comfortable with spending more than 30 minutes a day on social media. There's not that much that I need to keep up on. And I think that I've had experiences where I blow right through that limit and I say, give me 15 more minutes of this. But I think at the very least, it can give you an idea because it's sometimes it's hard to keep track of how long we're on something. These things are so captivating. It's how they're, they're built. There's the brightest minds in the world focused on making them that way. And it's hard. So like, even if I do go longer than a half hour, which I haven't lately, at least I know where I stand. At least I know, okay, I have something in my head. If, if you like, if you were to set that for an hour, at least you know that you've been on there for an hour. You can kind of gauge where you're at because it's hard to change something before you can really grasp where you are currently. So that's something that's been helpful for me, um, that type of tool. Obviously, if you can, if, if, if it's possible for you, just kind of putting it away for a day. Uh, even an hour. Um, I don't sleep with my phone in my room anymore. I, I put it away. I try to put it away uh, decently before bed. Usually it, I do kind of end up staying on it until pretty much I go to bed, but then it stays in the office and it's not, you know, the last thing that I look at before I go to bed and it's not the first thing that I pick up in the morning, which I think is important to just start to create that space for yourself. Um, and help your family members, like I said, clients just create, because it's going to be different for everybody. And I'm also sensitive to the fact that we're on it for, as adults, we're on it for work. We have to use it. We kind of have to be, we have to use this technology, but can we do it in a healthy way that where it doesn't encroach so much on our personal life, our relationships, our mental health. And I think we absolutely can do that, but it, it takes a decent amount of willpower and some trial and error. Um, and so it's kind of like a touch and go. You figure out what works for you. Makes sense. I, I think this, um, you mentioned time limits, measurement, becoming aware of how much consumption you're engaging in, uh, sort of, mm -hmm. sort of normally. Um, one of the questions just comes up over and over again, especially for parents is how much is too much? Simple question complicated answer. What do you think? <laughs> I wish I had, I wish I had the answer for you. I think that I am big on the distinction between quality and quantity. 
of screen time. I think that maybe focusing on the quality of it first might be a little bit more of an easier pathway to connecting with the child, the adolescent, about what the technology is. So one thing that my supervisor has told me multiple times, very simple advice, but for me, it's been pretty profound in my clinical practice is just get curious. Let's get curious about what, what is going on in this space. And I think at like a, a macro level, we can see that this age group has definitely some challenges, unique challenges with technology. But then if you take it down to the family level, like what I see in my office or what a family sees in their living room, it's unique. So some of these kids, sure, they are distracting themselves with social media. They are um, escaping. For some of them, though, they love music. They want to be music producers. They want to get into web development. That's where that stuff is happening. Maybe they're connecting with their friends. They're playing video games. I mean, for two years, they could barely see their friends. And and still, when they're in school, you know, they're wearing masks. It's the connection. It's really hard. So this is an avenue for them to connect. To me, those are all positive things. Uh, so I think that when we, if we fall into the trap of demonizing the technology, you create a wedge between your child, the child, and this thing that they like for whatever reason. Like, like I said, I think for every kid, it's a little bit different. And rather than, you know, you don't want to be that. You don't want to be that force in this because then you're kind of trying to pull them away from this thing that clearly they're getting some relief, enjoyment, education. I mean, so many of my clients that I see, the adolescents, they teach themselves through YouTube, through coding academies. They, I mean, they, they know what they want, kind of. And I think that technology is a beautiful avenue to connect with them and see what they're doing. Show me Minecraft. What is Minecraft? <laughs> you know, what, what, and, and what can we do together? Like, I know just a quick personal experience I had recently. My family was all together for, for an event and we were playing uh, Nintendo Switch bowling. Like, not many people that I know, at least, have a bowling alley in their house. But, and it was hilarious. Like, we were cracking up. We were having a great time together. We were laughing, connecting. And so to me, like that screen time is not equal to comparing myself to every other human being on earth on Instagram. It's, it's totally different. And I think that as, as parents, if you can, and, and first, I just want to say that you're up against it. It's, this is not easy work that I'm talking about. So, and I'm not a parent myself yet. So I'm not saying that this is easy work, but I just think that Maybe it will take some of the pressure off to say, you need to go from, you need to go from, you know, six hours a day to two hours a day, instead of just saying, first, what are these six hours? What's going on in this six hours? I think it's a wealth of knowledge that you can learn about your child and their interests and, um, and kind of meet them, meet them where they are, not to steal a, you know, a Virgil's, uh, you know, line there, but it's true. You meet them on in this space where they're comfortable, where they're interacting. Um, and I think it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for connection ultimately. I love that. It's yeah. Quality versus quantity. Good first step to think about. Be curious. That's very interesting, right? Because I think the, the impulse is to pull the plug. It's to say, no, it's that this is a bad thing. When you start asking questions, you understand, oh, there's, you know, you can kind of discern between these, this type of content or the types of interactions that are happening. And I think that's, this has been something that's um, been kind of interesting and eye-opening for us and learning more about uh, the, the sort of adolescent experience when it comes to using digital media. I think early on, I've, I very naively sort of was like, social media is bad and maybe generally that's true. But social, when we talk about the platforms that are driven by ads, but socially 
um, social experiences mediated by digital media or mediated by digital spaces or interfaces are in and of themselves not only bad, but they can be incredibly powerful if you're able to build meaningful connections, uh, learn something, do things, you know, create value. And you mentioned a couple of examples, um, you know, when it comes to learning programming or uh, how to make music and things like that. Are there mm-hmm. any other anecdotes that come to mind? Um, I'm curious if any of the clients you've worked with where you've seen things either relationally or when it comes to self-empowerment, uh, things go right when it comes to using technology? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Let me think. I, <clears throat> I don't know that I can sort of separate into right or wrong because I think that mm-hmm. every client that I see has elements of where they use technology in a really positive way and they have elements where they get stuck and they procrastinate on all these other things that they have to do because the technology is just so, I had a conversation with a client the other day, just about this idea of instant gratification versus kind of being able to delay that for a greater goal, um, something that you really want to work towards. And so for example, like these kids, like I said, they kind of get funneled into this school system now with uh, they're learning, they're learning about things that I have kids who they know I want to be an engineer. (laughs) I want to be a web developer, but then they go into school and they sit there for eight hours and they learn nothing about that, that subject. So they go online, they go on to YouTube or they enroll in these, these academies and they learn these things. And these are things that are going to empower them to do what they want to do with their lives. However, that is housed on the same exact device, the same platform as the, this never-ending comparison machine where they can feel self-conscious about themselves, about their body, because they're seeing these unrealistic standards over and over again. And... So it's like, I, I can't, you can't separate it, but, you know, maybe the, this sort of large scale mass education. And I do think that regulating the time on it is part of it. We need breaks from it. You need breaks from any, from everything, even things that are good for you. You can't exercise seven hours or I don't know, maybe if you're a professional athlete, but you can't really exercise 10 hours a day either. So Finding that line, and I think that, again, back to the collaboration, working with your child to find that line and see what is maybe, what's making them uncomfortable. What's, what is the discomfort online? What is hurting their mental health as opposed to empowering it and helping it? But we have to do it because it's all in the same place. We can't separate the two at this point. Um, so it's a challenge. So there may be some technical solutions. You mentioned things like monitoring screen time. I think that's a great step in the right direction. There's a lot of other technology that's that's starting to emerge that we're very excited about at Virgil's that helps with this as well. Mm -hmm. Um, But a lot of it, it seems to be an issue of almost uh, education or culture. So if you're going to be presented, I mean, just like in reality, right? You're presented with good and bad food or you know, nutritious or not nutritious food, Mm -hmm, you can find it mm -hmm. the same place, perhaps in the supermarket. Um, Relationships, you know, all kinds of stuff in the world of atoms. You have the same problem in in the world of bits now too. Mm -hmm. Um, You mentioned delayed gratification. That's very interesting because that, I've, I've heard this over and over that that seems to be at the root of a lot of the, the problematic behaviors. They all, it starts with, with the impulsiveness, with mm-hmm. lack of attention and, and sort of focus. Mm-hmm. How do you teach a kid to embrace delayed gratification in 2022? <laughs> Another fantastic question that I don't know that I have an exact answer for, but I think what I've seen success with is through this sort of framework of 
Okay, so this is interesting, actually, because we have to delay. For us, it would be gratifying to see the child, see our, our kids, um, these teens have a better relationship with technology, right? We want that to happen like that. That's its own special form of instant gratification. So I think that we also have to recognize this is going to take this is going to take time. So for me, what has been what I've noticed that's been sort of useful is in that whole sort of vein of getting curious is find out what motivates them, find out what they like and what they enjoy. And then this sort of intrinsic motivation can start to build and we can teach them that no matter what you do, like I, I love what I'm doing now. I love working with people, seeing them grow, change, face challenges. It's, it's not like I love every second of my job. It's just not, it's not normal. It's not natural. And maybe that's what gets people see online is always just all the positives and just helping to kind of psychoeducate them on the fact that, look, it's, if you want, if there's something you really want to do, you are going to face challenges and that you're going to have to put the phone away to study for that test, to write that thesis to apply for those jobs. It, it doesn't matter what it is. I think then what you, so you can have that whole conversation, which is a really interesting conversation to have with these kids because they're very tuned in. They have access to all this information. So they've seen things online that they want to do so that you can gain that information. Then the problem is, okay, now you have to go back to school. <laughs> and for, for the web developer, you've got to learn you know, you got to read Shakespeare, like, and you got nothing against Shakespeare. Like, uh, I like the guy; he's cool, and but it's not, it's not what they want to be doing. And so, but I think if you can maybe help them to see, help them to possibly just realize that this is a phase of life that they have to, as the the way the system currently is, kind of get through it for something better. If it's that they want to go to college. You know, they're going to need to have certain grades for that. Um, helping them to see that there's knowledge to be gained from all of this. You know, they still read Shakespeare for a reason. I mean, it's, there's something there that they can learn about. Um, and what I've also seen kind of as a side note is it opens up the opportunity for like, well, what, what do you think school should look like? What would your ideal day be like? And it's very far from what they're currently getting. But I think that going back to technology and the resources we have now, it's like we're not that far off from being able to kind of provide an experience that is more like that. And other countries are doing it, you know, where they are more focused on the individual child and the, the interests and they try to cultivate that instead of here's this kid with all these ideas. He's had all this access to really powerful information, but now we have to cram him into this um, kind of outdated experience where he has to sit there and not do that for eight hours. So then when he comes home from school, what's he going to do? He's going to go right back to it because he hasn't been able to really engage in that space, which is where he's finding his, he's finding his people, he's finding his information that he likes, you know, and I, I say he, but he, she, you know, anyone, they, everybody. It's like, it's a collective experience that we're having. Um, so, sorry if that was a tangent, but it's... No, um, it's, it's perfect. I mean, all this stuff is related. And and one of the one of the questions I would have, though, is, you know, I, ta I talked to um, someone yesterday who's going to come on the podcast who um, actually you know, really struggled with, uh, you know, video game addiction basically, mm -hmm. and eventually kind of turned his life around and now is doing some incredible, um, biology and psychology research work. Um, awesome. Which is really cool. Yeah. And oh. one of the things that came up is, you know, I think this is true of, of digital media, um, g generally, but especially when it comes to video games, just as an example, there seems to be this pattern of that being an easy thing to lose yourself in if you don't understand what's what the purpose is of the other things that you're supposed to be spending eight hours a day doing, right? So if you're at school and you're interested in web development, you're maybe not 
interested in, um, you know, English literature or something like that, mm-hmm. then it's, it's hard to get yourself motivated to do stuff. And worst case scenario, you'd have somebody who uh, has very little sense of purpose or has a, a, you know, does not have a good sense of um, where they want to be going. Mm-hmm. I've heard anecdotally, and this makes sense to me, that this is increasingly the case for uh, young people, um, in part because of the media environment where you have a lot of gloom and doom, but also because truly we do seem to be in a period of flux where there's, there's a lot of change. Changes seem to be accelerating. There's a lot of volatility. Um, and so it becomes more difficult to buy into the traditional narratives that would give you a, a sense of purpose, um, something that you could reliably work towards. A lot of that seems to be disintegrating, I think is too strong of a term, but um, it's, it's being challenged by what we're seeing uh, you know, in, in business and politics and culture and elsewhere. So if you're, if you're a kid or if you're a parent, where um, your kid really does not know what it is they want to do. They haven't quite figured out what that thing is that gets them excited to um, engage in activities that, you know, require discipline and focus and, you know, makes it easier to avoid the distractions, uh, mm-hmm. like the video games, which simulate, uh, you know, those, those sort of satisfying behaviors. They haven't figured that out. What's a good first step that a parent can take to, to help them start to develop a sense of purpose. Mm. Yeah, you make a great point. I think also, you know, this idea of purpose, <laughs> um, I think we're all kind of looking for that, especially like you mentioned, there's sort of this major shift happening just in the way that we view that we kind of view everything at this point. Um, and they're going through that too. And that is just so much pressure. Like we talked about how we grew up, like how we grew up as kids. It's very different. And so they're faced with just so much extra information, extra, like you said, kind of doom and gloom. Uh, they may not know right now what it is that they want to do. And that's perfectly fine because they're kids, you know, and maybe it's just finding instead of necessarily what it is they want to ultimately do. Um, you know, is there anything else that they enjoy? You know, I, I, I think I agree that the, the video games can be incredibly captivating and they can be, uh, that's what the kid wants to do, you know, and it's hard to watch if, if, um, you know, our child just wants to spend all his time, his or her time on video games. Um, but if there's any way, you know, as a, as a family and, and families are busy, parents are busy, it's not that easy, but any way to just connect outside of that space, even if it's a 15 minute walk around the block, you know, that's a start. It's something where you, you get them out of that space. Um, and I, I think just accepting the fact that at the beginning, it, it, you may not see much change immediately, but just being, letting them know that, that you see this, that you see the, the amount of time they're spending, that, you know, maybe even that you're a little concerned about it, but not then jumping right to, you know, we have to change this right now. Because again, I think it's the same, it's similar with when you talk about like a, a technology addiction, it's similar to other types of addictions where there's all this stuff at the root that you can't get to if you are sort of hyper-focused on that issue. So for exa- to use another kind of a similar example, if it's alcohol use or, or drug use, you know, one thing that has a lot of support in the literature is this concept of motivational interviewing, where you roll with the resistance to turning off the video games, to, you know, stopping drinking, whatever it is, because then you're a collaborative partner in the experience with your child and you can, it's a journey. It it really, you're embarking on a journey and 
uh, it's not easy, but if you can take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, just away from the screen, or can I play that with you? You know, I mean, maybe for the, you know, the cool parents out there, your, your kid will let you jump on and you can, you know, or just watch them, just have them dictate it to you, narrate it. And I think there's just so much to, to learn in that experience. And it, it may not, it likely won't change overnight, but just that process of getting to know them better, whether it's purpose or not, maybe they just find another hobby, but that's a stepping stone to potentially other things like finding a purpose or maybe an occupation or a profession or, um, but it kind of starts with those little mini micro steps. Um, so I would say even don't, don't scoff at five or 10 minutes with your child and just having a conversation. And if what you need to do is kind of be honest with them about what you're seeing, I think these kids are, ultimately I see that they also know, they kind of know when it's too much, but they just don't want to stop. They can't stop. They're having a lot of challenges with that, rightfully so. Um, so the, just those little steps, whatever it is that you can offer, you know, and if you can't get it, get it away from the screen, see if you can get it side by side, you know, looking at the screen, really a collaborative partner as opposed to this is a problem that needs to be fixed and it needs to be fixed now. Because um, I, and I can totally empathize with that. Like, like I said before, you want to see that. That's the ultimate goal. Um, but it's taken a long time to get here, relatively. I mean, it's taken years to get to this point and it may take weeks, months, years to kind of restabilize. And it starts with those little steps, right? A few minutes, meeting where they are, makes a lot of sense. So I want to switch gears just for a second. Speaking of learning and new experiences um, and uh, technology, hopefully for good, uh, you've been using virtual reality to connect remotely with your clients. Tell me about that. Yeah, absolutely. That's also been its own journey. It's been really exciting for me. I think what I've seen with, you know, I mean, maybe we can all put ourselves in our 13 year old shoes for a second. And, you know, what do you really want to be in kind of a cramped office with someone talking about your problems? Or do you want to be taking a hike through a forest and, you know, dropping gifts, uh, gifs, gifs into the, um, into the space to express yourself, emojis, kind of cracking jokes with your, you know, with peers. Uh, do you want that collaborative experience? I think most of us would choose the latter. And even for me too, it's, it's been, it just kind of, I've had the experience actually with the headset and you you literally can temporarily enter this other world and you can you go from being in this sort of mundane setting to just having this whole other world at your fingertips to explore and going back to like getting curious it makes it much easier because you're meeting them in their place and they feel comfortable and i've had clients teach me how to use it, you know, and I'm fumbling around and, and all of a sudden that power dynamic is much more even and, it, and it's much more even they're the ones educating me on this, this software. They're, I, I have found that they're more open, their language changes, it becomes more conversational, more like they would maybe talk with their friends as opposed to speaking to like an adult. Or an authority figure. Um, not that I consider myself that, but just you know, speaking to like a quote unquote professional or or anybody, it's it's. Um, and I think that the the avatar element of it is also it lends a really interesting color to it because for me, I, like I said before at the beginning, I get Zoom fatigue. I don't really want to sit on a screen and just stare into a camera for eight hours either. So it's this really fun way to just add a wrinkle in and add something different and, and meet these clients 
in a place, first of all, that they can do conveniently because I, that's another scheduling challenge with with adolescents and children is the parents have to get them or somewhat, somebody has to get them to the office. Um, this also kind of does away with that. They can just log in from home for an hour, you know, take a break from homework or from whatever else it is they're doing and meet in this space and meet with, with me and or peers and have quality. It's, it's one hour of supervised quality screen time, um, where you just get to know them. And it's, it's been really cool to see. Excellent. All right. Well, I think we're coming up on time. So I want to make sure that uh, everybody can, can find you, can reach out. I know you're working on a website, some other stuff. Uh, for right now, folks can find you on LinkedIn. Is that right? Yeah. So the main focus for me has just been developing, uh, you know, as a counselor, I haven't really done too much in the marketing space. So just if you can find me on LinkedIn, it's uh, James Ziegler. I think if you if you'll drop it in the show notes, yeah, uh, would love to connect there. And then whenever anything does evolve, it you'll be able to find it there for sure. That was good. That's good, Jamie. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. I'll uh, I'll see you soon, both in the metaverse and uh, in reality. Hopefully, likewise, Christian. Thanks a lot. All right, have a good one. Bye bye. You too.